So the second panel um, is focused on opportunity zones, and this is a new and emerging topic for our community and also is a very timely one. I think the Opportunity Zone was on the front cover of the New York Times, I believe, last week, and it offered a critique on this new policy and some of the, and some of the points that uh, Kat Taylor mentioned. So our panelists here will talk about what Opportunity Zones are and what the obstacles um, and opportunities are of this new policy and what this all means for higher ed institutions. So I'm going to turn it over to Chisato uh, from Impact Experience, who will be moderating this panel. Great. Uh, so my name is Chisato Calvert. I'm the Director of Strategic Partnerships at Impact Experience, and I have the pleasure of being on a panel um, with my colleagues. Um, to the far left, Jacob Moore. He's the Assistant VP of Tribal Relations at Arizona State University. Um, and to my left here is Graham Richard. He's the former mayor of Fort Wayne, Indiana, and he is the managing partner uh, for Graham Richard Associates. And as Kaede mentioned, um, and a lot of the conversations we had earlier today really echo around opportunity zones and um, given that it's designed specifically to bring capital into low-income communities through providing tax benefits, it's really important to think about um, the actual process, the actual impact, and ultimately who is benefiting um, from uh, these projects. And so this session is really a special opportunity for us to hear from two different perspectives um, based on their experiences and their expertise around opportunity zones and particularly thinking about university engagement. So to start off, um, Jacob would love to hear a little bit from you about your background um, as well as how you became involved in the work that you're involved with now at ASU. Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? So let's cook down to Anya Chug, Jacob Moore. Anya um Akamiratam, Tanatam, Lakota, and Dakota. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jacob Moore. I'm a citizen of the Tanatam Nation in southern Arizona, which is actually uh, has about 70 miles of international border. Our um, tribal community is, was uh, bisected by the Gadsden Purchase. Um, so uh, the, our the traditional land lands are also in Mexico as well. My my grandmother was born in a village called Pozo Verde, which is on the south of the border, and uh, again, about 70 miles of international border. That is the uh, Don Atham site, Akamir Atham, same language, uh, different community is Pima, or the river people, which is, um, we have four, four southern tribes, Salt River, Pima, Maricopa, and the metropolitan Phoenix area, adjacent to Scottsdale, which is where I live. My wife is from there. Uh, the Gila River Indian community just south of the Phoenix area. The uh, Akchen Indian community and Thanatham Nation are all part of one larger group. That's on my father's side. So on my mother's side, I'm also Lakota and Dakota I'm, I'm Sioux. Um, my mother is from, uh, originally from Fort Peck, which is northeastern Montana, about 50 miles from the Canadian border, so I'm very lucky to be here, uh, given the proximity of where my parents came from, which, which is from two different borders, uh, northern border and southern border. And her mother was from Cheyenne River, which is in South Dakota, um, the Lakota site. And so to the, to the question of how did I get here, um, <laughs> I, I, I did grow up in southern Arizona, my father's uh, community and the, and the reservation of the Thanatham Nation. We moved to Tempe when I was in high school. My, my dad actually got his degree from ASU in education with a minor in Indian Ed. And um, I finished my high school in Tempe and interestingly, uh, one of my first jobs, I, I went to a year of college and then uh, took a, went to work and really it was hard for me to get back to, to, to college again once I started working. So this is uh, really a fun place for me to be because I, um, I started out as a bookkeeper um, for Valley National Bank, which was a state bank. So I like the question about financial technology because I was a banker back in the days when if the power went out, you just took out a crank out of the drawer and you could still run transactions. Um, you didn't need electricity to do that. Um, as long as we had access to the phone line and we could check the computer to see if you actually had a balance in your account and we could cash a check. Um, and so from um, a bookkeeper to a teller to um, operations, 14 years um, in banking, really from the, during the time of state banking into 
interstate banking, um, went through three mergers and acquisitions in nine years from uh, Citibank to Norwest Bank to Wells Fargo, and after three mergers and acquisitions, decided to get out of banking altogether because <laughs> um, every time you figured it out, it, it, things changed um, and it continues to change even today. And um, I'll try and keep this short, but my father was the, uh, on his own trajectory, had uh, gone from education, from working at community college to the university, to the director of Indian Ed of the state of Arizona, to becoming the, the chairman of our tribe, of the Thanatham Nation. And he passed away in 93. Um, he was actually in office. He developed colon cancer and died at the age of 59. And so folks were saying, well, what are you going to do? And I had always been on the corporate side. So for me, you know, the decision was, well, I guess I'm going to go back and finish that degree and go work for tribes. I had never worked for a tribe before. And so I had laser focused in terms of going to Arizona State and getting a degree in finance with the real expectation of going to tribal communities to parlay my banking experience and a degree in finance and helping tribes in economic development. I did an honors thesis on uh, CDFIs versus SBICs at the time, which was during the Clinton administration. And so I remember um, being challenged with finding a professor who would be my sponsor uh, because nobody within our College of Business had ever worked for tribal communities before. So I had to convince a, a professor in economics who did uh, Latin American research that tribes were very much like third world countries <clears throat> um, in terms of uh, economic development. So I had finished that degree and went out to Salt River, Pima Maricopa, really to who has great opportunities in, in terms of commercial leasing, ag leasing, uh, home sites, and, uh, and then ended up in their Office of Government Affairs. And uh, so that's the short version. The, the last part is that my role at Arizona State is um, in government affairs. I'm not a faculty member, I'm not a researcher. Dr. Brian Brayboy is our uh, special assistant to President Crow on American Indian initiatives. Um, my role is in government affairs and, and as I've mentioned in a couple of my table discussions is that I felt like I'm a kid in a candy store because really my heart is with the tribes in terms of capacity building and I get to reach into individual colleges, whether it's engineering or education or law, to create programs and partnerships with tribal communities to help them build capacity, not in terms of just um, student uh, tracks or, or educational degrees, but also in terms of innovation and technology and really helping tribes to find their way in terms of self-governance and, so, and sustainability. Thank you. Graham, would you be able to share a little bit about your background and how you became engaged in what you're doing now? Thank you. Yes, my name is Graham Richard, and I'm the former mayor of Fort Wayne, Indiana. And I was recruited uh, by uh, Tom Steyer and Hamant Tunisia and others to help start the advanced energy economy, uh, which now in seven years of work is a uh, clean energy chamber of commerce, promoting a prosperity agenda for clean, secure, affordable energy policy. Uh, very important, of course, in California to make sure that we open the markets for clean energy technologies and policies. But it's also important in my home state of Indiana, where as the mayor of Fort Wayne, Mike Pence was a member of Congress representing Fort Wayne, and up until recently, we've had 70% of the electricity produced by coal. And so across the country, we've been an advocate for policy changes that open up markets to clean energy. After doing that for six years, to spend a little bit more time with my uh, uh, family, particularly my three grandchildren, to help homeschool them, um, I decided also when we saw that Senator uh, uh, Scott and Senator Booker amended on a bipartisan basis uh, with the support of a, no a number of others, uh, and added the Opportunity Zone tax uh, section of the code, that this could create the single largest tax-advantaged community-based investment. From my experience in Fort Wayne, where we had uh, you know, million square feet of abandoned shopping mall, uh, 13,000 General Electric workers, at the time I was a member of the Indiana State Senate early in my career, by the time I was mayor, they were all gone, 10,000 international harvester workers gone, lots of brownfields. Um, so if you're kind of cognizant of your geography, Fort Wayne is the city that's equidistant between 
Indianapolis and Detroit, uh, second largest city in the state, 500 metro area, 265,000 population. And so when we saw that communities across the state of Indiana, but then in California, there are 800 opportunity zones, there are 30 of them in Oakland. If $300 billion is the estimate of private sector money that will flow into these low-income communities, will it be spent for refinancing payday lenders? Will it be spent for throwing up carbon-polluting new buildings? I think colleges, universities, hospitals, the opportunity for city governments as anchor institutions will be the deciding players in each of those 8,700 low-income communities. And so I'm passionate about making sure that we encourage equitable, clean investments in opportunity zones that hire lots of local folks. Thank you. Um, Jacob, would you be able to share a little bit more about, uh, from a university's perspective, ASU's commitment um, from the president's office in terms of ASU's involvement in the conversation around opportunity zones and more broadly with community engagement um, and what role you see ASU playing in this space? Sure, you know, I, um, it's a lot of fun working at Arizona State University. For those that haven't met President Crow, you should. Um, he's quite innovative, you know, he's got the new, new American University model, very much an enterprise model in terms of what's, what's happening there. Um, as I mentioned, my, my father got his degree in education in the late 60s, and my mother got her degree in social work from Arizona State in the 80s in social work. I got my undergrad in finance in the 90s and then came back, uh, I, I don't think I had any choice after my parents went to school there, um, and came back and did the executive MBA program in, uh, <clears throat> in 2008. So I've kind of watched um, Arizona State for 50 years. I've been hanging around the campus for 50 years and really have seen the changes, the transforma transformational changes, and really on a vision in terms of what universities can do. And, um, you know, I have our charter on the back of my business card, and some of you may have it down since I've been handing it out, is that President Crow thinks it keeps, you know, the, keeps the message short and precise and, and really has been our change agent. So the charter is ASU is a comprehensive public research university measured not by whom we exclude but rather who we include and how they succeed, advancing research and discovery of public value and assuming fundamental responsibility for the economic, social, culture, cultural, and overall health of the communities that it serves. You know, the, and it's, it's not just words, it's really what we live by in terms of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, for me, uh, the fact that we have over 3,000 American Indian students, arguably the largest number of American Indian students of any major university in the country, we have more students at Arizona State than uh, the UC system combined, <clears throat> um, not to call you out. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a little bit, um, and, I, and I do have to give credit to your president, Janet Napolitano, who is our governor, and uh, had appointed me to the State Board of Education when I was uh, working in, in when she was in Arizona. And but it, you know there are words to live by in the sense that um, whether you look at not just what you know our our goal of really equity that, as President Crow would say, we're not just taking A students, we're taking B students as well, and really kind of growing communities and giving them opportunities to, to pursue a degree in higher education, but also the embeddedness in terms of not just uh, working toward academic progress, but really to become directly involved within the communities on whether it's environmental issues or social issues or equity issues. We have 22 tribal nations within the state of Arizona, and really from a land-based perspective, the, those tribes control about 20 27% 27% of the land in Arizona. We also have a lot of federal partners, you know, that control about another third of part of a third of the state is federal land, whether it's um, Bureau of Reclamations or national parks or state state uh, park land. So really, private land in Arizona is only about one-third of the, the overall mass in terms of uh, state. 
And tribes have been somewhat the, uh, you know, the, uh, the sleeping giant in that they control significant resources, water, timber, you know, mineral rights, and, and those types of issues. And so, um, you know, I think there's a, a, a natural collaborative potential in terms of what Arizona State can do in terms of working with tribal communities. The, the work that Arizona State does at large in terms of not only increasing the number of uh, minority students, underserved populations, and, and target hires in terms of as many faculty that we can bring in. Um, we also look at, if you look at things like uh, the first uh, Global Institute of Sustainability in the nation, uh, before really anybody understood what sustainability meant or what, what does a center within a university around global sustainability do, is that we have over 30 American Indian faculty and part of their conversation has been about, well, sustainability is a nice term, but this is really nothing new in terms of indigenous knowledge or traditional knowledge. Kat had mentioned that in her comments and, and I do want to give her credit for uh, really recognizing that those that have been most um, disadvantaged really are perhaps uh, more likely to have those solutions that will save our planet. Uh, this understanding of hol holistic approach and that um, we're all connected uh, and we're connected to everything around us. So I'm starting to wait, go away from your question, but I, I do think that it's a fun place to be and with President Crow, it's never big enough or fast enough or crazy enough. And um, you know, if you screw it up, that's okay. Just make a different mistake next time, so. Thank you, and I think that links really well. Um, I know, Graham, a lot of your work sort of intersecting with land and also environment and clean energy infrastructure. Could you provide an overview of how you know, your work in environmental um, kind of governance and infrastructure uh, interlays with opportunity zones and also just your perspective um, of the role of universities and what role they can play in this? May I give a couple of examples? Uh, one, it's a hometown one, and then uh, one that we were just talking about historically black colleges and universities. And I think you, you uh, shared with me that there are 85 historically black colleges and universities that are in opportunity zones. Uh, in my hometown of Fort Wayne, uh, when I got elected with an overwhelming mandate in 1999 of um, uh, 76 votes, a lawsuit, and a recount, <laughs> I, I was advised by my political folks to you know, take it easy because you'll never get reelected and instead we decided to go the opposite direction. And one of the most critical partnering efforts that we started uh, on to lead to have community-based broadband, uh, to resurrect this old million square foot of abandoned mall, 100 acres, uh, and to do downtown revitalization was to build a new kind of alliance with the Fort Wayne Community Schools where we had uh, 32,000 students, a uh, very high percentage of those uh, school lunch eligible students. So uh, classic situation, 50,000 people move out of the heart of your city and they move to the suburbs uh, and they leave behind the folks that typically can't move. Um, and then you have uh, the colleges and the universities. So seven of them came together and we began uh, you know, a really important public-private partnership today. That same partnership there is a collaborative effort to buy rent space, rather, in a new development that is the result, and this was featured in the New York Times recently, of um, 1.2 million square feet of abandoned general electric, 100-year-old multi-story manufacturing with the beautiful general electric sign over the top of that. So what we had previously a location for 13,000 employees now, none. And so the developers who had significant experience in Raleigh, North Carolina and other places have bought the property with uh, public sector support and investment in an opportunity zone. And the colleges and the universities came together and said, let's create a new creative learning space in cooperation with each other, which was not always common. And then uh, the hospital, largest hospital system, uh, with over 3,000 employees, 13,000 employees, is also opening, taking space. So they're providing a rental commitment that can then be part of the capital stack for the financing 
they're seeking opportunity zone investors because it's in an opportunity zone. So that's a collaborative effort. Second piece is being done in other communities. I'll give you an example in Delaware, give you an example, many in Colorado, for example, where you take a brownfield and the off taker of turning the brownfield into a bright field, a community solar power, power plant, is the, is the college or the university. So they say, okay, we'll buy the clean energy from this community solar garden. And by the way, in a couple of cases, we're promoting this locally, there's a low income housing project nearby that can also benefit by having that 100% clean, inexpensive power and residents of that low income housing, uh, residential housing, may never have a chance in the near term, a typical resident in the Fort Wayne Housing Authority or our uh, for-profit tax supported housing units in Fort Wayne, uh, is a single mom with three kids working two jobs. Just, you know, really challenged. So to own her own home. Now, in this case, they're saying for anybody that's a resident, they will own a share of the community solar garden. So that, that woman's gonna have equity being built up in a community solar uh, asset that generates revenue. The college, university, hospital, city government can, go, can collaborate, they can come together. So I would urge our friends here to think of the convening power of the university, the college, and the ability to put some catalytic creative capital into these projects, which by the way, today, are now really safe investments. We're not talking about uh, something that doesn't exist with no track record in finance. Clean energy, whether it's rooftop solar and residential, whether it's commercial, whether it's community-based solar, we got all kinds of data, and the costs are just coming down for the installation of that. So a fast, booming part of the clean economy is local community solar, there's a team in Chicago that we're working with. There's a team in other states, a nonprofit group called Elevate Energy. Um, Grid Alternatives just won a million dollar grant along with a company that I happen to be, uh, full disclosure, an investor in from the Department of Energy to come up with a new model so that they can afford to put rooftop solar on low income housing where the challenge has always been. I see a nodding head here. The owner, whether it's a for profit or non profit, usually is on a sub-metered basis, so all of the investment to put rooftop solar and storage and nest thermostats, energy efficiency, means the tenant's bill goes down. Good thing, but not economically viable for the owner of the property who has to put up the money in the front end to invest it. We're seeing that new model in opportunity zones attract private sector investors who will uh, work with the local nonprofits to have the internal rate of return so good that you can cut the owner of the building in to the savings that come from the reduced uh, energy costs, the reduced utility bill costs. At the same time, you're reducing pollution in mostly highly polluted low income communities. So you're getting the triple bottom line benefit. The Opportunity Zone funding can be leveraged to do that. And any college, any university in the country could get in the middle of facilitating that even if they didn't want to put any money in it, they were just willing to be the off taker for the power. Thank you. And as cl closing comments, um, would both of you just briefly be able to share um, what are some key uh, steps that universities can really take and who are some of the other people that need to be at the table? So I think going back to the last question, was how do universities participate in terms of uh, opportunity zone, um, you know, I guess initiatives in, in discussions, and I think it's as much about discussions. It was mentioned earlier that this idea in terms of how this information is shared, uh, knowing kind of the trajectory of opp opportunity zones, uh, the New York, New York Times article, but really the intent and, and those opportunities in terms of um, investing in, in underserved populations. We did have a conversation at Arizona State that was convened by the Opportunity Experience. 
um, which brought people from, you know, the um, Chicanos por la Causa, the, our Native American communities that are in community development um, to really discuss about uh, how, how do we participate. The one thing that universities can play are the conveners, uh, oftentimes kind of the third party convener that can, can really help through that conversation. Um, when uh, we, you know, President Crow, as he describes those of us that work in the, in the president's office, we have about 120,000 students between five campuses and a robust online program. And so he describes us as um, concierge, you know, that those of us work in the president's office are concierge and we can certainly help establish initiatives and, and get you know, new programs started, um, regardless of, across the board in terms of what universities do, whether it's in public policy or law or education, is that universities are great conveners for, for conversation and developing initiatives. What came out of the conversation that we had amongst those that are really serving those communities already from a community development perspective was, was looking at what they broke down into subcommittees was uh, thinking about community education, really having some understanding of the benefits of opportunity zones. The other is who are the government actors and how do you engage with the government actors in terms of helping to facilitate what are those areas of needs, um, a committee on maps. You know, where are these um, potential locations for development going to occur? Who are the landowners? Um, and is there some type of community benefit agreement? Um, what is the opportunity zone language? And how do we do establish that narrative? What is the community feedback? This is where we oftentimes understand what I think is, um, I don't want to say it's just perceived, but this dichotomy between a rate of return and intentionality in terms of community investment uh, that brings good, you know, to, to communities. Uh, it, there's sometimes there's a cognitive dissonance between, uh, as Kat mentioned, folks that have, that are in that position to have significant capital gains oftentimes are necessarily those that are mostly tied to intentional investing. Um, and what is the, the scorecard or this in terms of how um, you, know, you can do the stress testing in terms of these models that there is a return, but also there's social good that can come out of that that doesn't end up just in gentrification. And then, uh, you know, who are the, uh, what are those uh, impact levers that can really make significant change in communities? This understanding of social investment as much as um, financial investment. And then also that engagement with investors. Um, as mentioned, I think universities are in a, in a unique position to really be conveners around these conversations. And, you know, as I started out, I mentioned that my experience in terms of a, a college of business was that these weren't the kinds of conversations that were talked about in terms of how can you do that in tribal communities. So how do we build curriculum within schools, too, that can help advocate for this type of programming that's different than just training somebody to go work in the, in the, in the stock market. Um, uh, my last closing thought is that we have probably one of the greatest examples of where that need is occurring um, when we think about the environmental impact is that uh, the closure of the Navo generating station is basically it got its last uh, load of uh, coal the, that was delivered by rail last week. <clears throat> um, Navajo Generating Station is on the Navajo Reservation. Peabody Coal is on the Hopi Reservation. Between those two entities, it's 800 high paying jobs in an extremely rural area, 400 jobs on the Peabody Coal side, 400 jobs on the Navajo Generating, generating side. So obviously a great environmental win in terms of shutting down this plant. And it didn't shut down uh, for environmental reasons. It was really the economy in terms of uh, propane being uh, less expensive than coal-produced energy. But how do you replace those 800 jobs in a rural area, or do people just simply move away? Um, there are um, impact investment money there in terms of solar, alternative energy. Uh, some of the chapter houses on the Navajo Reservation are taking advantage of some impact investing dollars and really kind of uh, transitioning some of that to, to solar and wind energy, it doesn't necessarily solve the job problems, it solves it a little bit. 
but again, these are the kinds of opportunities that I think uh, the market take, could take a hard look at. I, I have a question, if I can ask the audience. Uh, how many of you uh, either are you know, alumni of or affiliated with a college or university that is promoting entrepreneurial growth and, and having things like accelerators on the campus or engaged in that? How many of you? Yeah. Um, uh, Recently at a conference that Steve Malt is very familiar with, at the end of that uh, Opportunity Zone conference, uh, some folks from KPMG and others were asked this question. In the Bay Area, what will be an unintended consequence or an unanticipated consequence of the Opportunity Zones uh, 10 years from now? And I'm paraphrasing what was said, but in the nugget it was, the centers of economic growth will be Oakland, San Jose, and Sacramento. Why? Because if you are selling your Amazon stock today for whatever reason, and you want to defer that capital gain, you can invest in the next Airbnb, Amazon, whatever the startup is, by a bright team of people coming out of a college or university Defer your capital gain, hold it for the full 10 years, and again, almost defer if you have a successful company indefinitely, almost. That's a massive additional internal rate of return. So you're starting to see venture capitalists, many of them financed by endowments in this room, tell early stage companies, go find an opportunity zone to start your company in, because if you hit it big, our investors will end up having an additional benefit for that investment. If you couple that with the transition to clean energy, massively needed, there is a transformational potential for that 300 billion, 400 billion, to be the Green New Deal now, to actually accelerate the growth of companies, housing, clean energy, broadband, local uh, infrastructure that's needed because all of those things can be funded by oppor Opportunity Zone funding. That is a wonderful thing to imagine. The reverse could be true. We could have more carbon pollution, financing of companies that we really don't care to have grow and expand, even though people would be making money off that. And so that's where the local communities, a college, a university, an intentional endowment process can be critical to what happens in the opportunity zone near your institution. Thank you so much, both Jacob and Graham. Uh, I think we have time for maybe one or two questions. Um, so we'll open it up to the audience. Capital, so that you you use the opportunity zone capital gains money, tie it with grants, tie it with tax credits, tie it with public subsidies. Who becomes the convener of that kind of financial structure where everybody chips in? Well, my colleague um, Julia Parson, who um, was the co-founder of Working Assets and uh, was the founder of the Urban Sustainability Directors Network, and um, She's based in Chicago. We've been putting together across the country examples. So just real quickly, one example is Northeastern University is working in four communities um, in uh, New Orleans, uh, Charlotte, uh, in Roxbury, um, and they are helping to convene those players who could be additional catalytic capitalists in the opportunity zones. That's one, just one example. Uh, MIT is working in Puerto Rico. All of Puerto Rico is an opportunity zone, and they are working with a hospital and with um, low-income housing to bring rooftop solar and battery storage to build resilience for those low-income individuals that are still suffering from the ravages of the previous hurricane. Um, there are other examples as well. Uh, what we need to do, I think, is find them, share them, get people to understand the capital stack and how it can be advantaged uh, bring the local community foundations to the table, talk to the healthcare foundations, 
I can give you an example in, again, my home state of Indiana. We're in Wabash, Indiana, a smaller community. The local hospital was purchased. It was 100 years old, purchased by the nonprofit hospital system Parkview in Fort Wayne. Parkview is giving the land fully remediated on the 100-year-old building in downtown Wabash, plus another five acres, to bring that to almost 20 acres for a mixed use, um, which will have a combination of residential, uh, office, uh, re retail, and different ranges. And for that community where housing becomes critical to keeping local businesses because there isn't enough housing there uh, to keep uh, people who want to work there. So those are some examples where an anchor institution can think about it, engage with the community. Uh, again, I think hospitals and colleges working together, just their buying power of electricity can change the nature of a discussion in a community. Hey y'all, uh, Rachel Schluter from Divest Ed. Thank you for speaking on the panel. I had uh, just a short question. So I'm coming from the student organizing side. So folks who are organizing for fossil fuel divestment and reinvestment back into our communities. Um, so interested to hear what you think the role of divestment is when it comes to the university taking an active role in their community, um, specifically through bringing like capital and investing in the community in the story of like community solar programs, do you see fossil fuel divestment as a critical piece in that so that the capital that they're bringing is not tied to the fossil fuel industry? Um, and if you do, do you see moments of synergy in that or potential friction of bringing fossil fuel divestment into the conversation of our universities taking a more active role in our communities? So I'll start by saying I'm not on the foundation side. <laughs> and uh, uh, Jeff Midland, yeah, I'll call him out, and, and he's, um, there's Jeff. Um, well, glad he's here, because I, you know, and I have to, you know, I think what, what was important for me to share was that, you know, I'm on the government affairs side. Jeff and I are in the same building. I'm on the third floor in government affairs, and Jeff is in the foundation, which is on the sixth floor. And so I think this is really a great opportunity for us to that nexus in terms of that conversation about, what are what are universities delivering in terms of um, uh, a product, so to speak, and, and as far as the education side and the research side, and really the foundation side, and in some ways um, it, it supports that in, in multiple ways. And, and certainly, there's a portfolio there. Uh, I serve on the um, board for Arizona Community Foundation, which is a little over nine hundred million dollars, close to a million dollars, the largest community foundation in Arizona and very much interested in impact investing and has a lot of donor directed dollars as well. Um, I'm not gonna answer your question directly because I'm certainly not the person within the university to do that. But I think what I do wanna touch on that's related to the, to the kind of these issues of divestment is the experience that tribes have gone through, which is um, again, not to kind of rehash what Kat, Kat, Kat had talked about, but this idea of, um, of uh, uh, decolonization in terms of the way that we look at, at market and really environmental racism. The, the largest, um, most recent example of that was the Dakota Access Pipeline in North Dakota. Um, and really a line that originally would have been routed through the Bismarck area. And obviously Bismarck was not interested in having this pipeline come through its community, so it got moved into a tribal community and went across the tribal community and there was a significant effort from the tribe side, obviously a protest that became violent and really was shut down in terms of the activism that went on there. But you know, Wells Fargo Bank and others were called out in terms of their, their participation in supporting the Dakota Access Pipeline. So you know, I, I really appreciate the conversation in the room today and especially from, for me, what I see is millennials that have taken a significant interest in this. I uh, mentioned in one of our table discussions that we weren't having these conversations when I was in my business program back in the 80s. You know, there was responsible investment, but not to the degree of really being concerned about um, divestment. So I applaud that effort. And again, coming from a tribal perspective is really uh, the devastation that has been done on tribal communities as a result of extraction 
in how do we help tribes reestablish those economies, but more importantly, take control of managing their own resources in a responsible way. So, thank you. Thank you both so much, and um, I think both of your responses have really planted the seed for much uh, food for thought, and to be able to hear concrete examples and from your experiences um, of how much um, there's a critical need and a critical role that universities can really play, and that there already have been some alliances and some partnerships built uh, to ensure that opportunity zone investments are really done in an equitable and inclusive and sustainable way is very encouraging. So thank you very much for, for sharing your thoughts and perspectives. Let's give a round of applause to our panelists.